Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 171st New Social Environment. I'm Emily, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for the 13th Radical Poetry Reading, curated by Cole Swenson. Every Wednesday, a guest curator invites a number of poets who they admire to the NSE to read political poetry. And we are so thrilled to have poets Atel Adnan, Biswamit Bubedi, Susan Howe, and Khazal Mozadek here with us today. The Brooklyn Rail recognizes the illegal annexation of Republic of Artshock as a grave international injustice. We stand in support of the Armenian people and the global Armenian diaspora. The Brooklyn Rail acknowledges that we are on the unceded territory of the Leni Lenape, Kanarsi, Shinnecock, and Munsee peoples. We acknowledge the many indigenous nations with ties to this land, and we recognize that the Lenape still call Manahata home. Finally, the Brooklyn Rail stands in solidarity with the uprising unfolding across the country following the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Nina Pop, David McAdey, James Scurlock, Jamel Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Rayshard Brooks, Rhea Milton, Dominique Remy Fells, and Toyin Salau, and Walter Wallace Jr. in response to generations of structural violence against Black communities. Black Lives Matter, and we will continue to support ongoing action in the struggle for racial justice. Before I introduce our curator, we'd like to begin with a brief moment of silence. Thank you. And now to introduce today's curator. Cole Swenson has published 17 volumes of poetry and a collection of critical essays, Noise That Stays Noise. A book of hybrid poem essays, Art in Time, is coming out from Night Boat in the spring. A former Guggenheim Fellow, she has been a finalist for the National Book Award and has been awarded the Iowa Poetry Prize, the SF State Poetry Center Book Award, and the National Poetry Series. She has also translated over 20 volumes of poetry, prose, and art criticism from French and won the 2004 Penn USA Award in Literary Translation. Cole, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to Anselm and Emily and Fong and Nick and everyone at The Rail for inviting me and for supporting this wonderful series. It's been great to to have it. And warm thanks to everyone here for finding the time to join and listen. Before going further, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm reading from unceded lands of the Coast Miwok peoples just north of San Francisco near Cal uh, in California. In addition to the ways that the term radical is used socially and politically today, I also think of it in its etymological sense of deviating at the root. Just a quick background, it comes from the Proto-Indo-European root rad, W-R-A-D, meaning branch or root, then segued into Latin as radix, also meaning root. From there, it slithered into late Latin radicalis, of or having roots, and by the mid 17th century, it had taken on the meaning of going to the origin or getting to the essence. The political use of the word indicating reform first emerged in the extremist wing of the British Liberal Party in 1802. In that context, it meant a change at the root. It's at this point that it seems to me, the word becomes very pertinent to poetry, which pierces language to its very root and begins engaging with it, operating on it and transforming it from there outward. Put succinctly, poetry simply is deviant use of language which sounds like a definition, but I'd prefer to look at it not as a definition, but as a function. That of taking in its literal sense, a radical turn at the roots of language and continuing from there on to always avoid the expected root, in fact, any pre-established root, so that language is constantly entering territory not yet crossed by language. Territory perhaps not yet crossed because it lies between various already trampled terrains. 
With that in mind, I thought it would be interesting to consider the potentials of, potential, of perpetual deviation in the work of people who occupy betweens, both between languages and between media. I wanted to take the question beyond the narrow definition of language as something exclusively confined to words and to engage the language of the visual in order to consider the effects of the visual faculties being called upon to do double duty in its own between of simultaneously seeing and reading. How might a multiplicitous and multimedia backgroundscape increase or activate the possibilities and types of radical deviation? In this time of such political and social extremes, the, the between has become an extremely charged zone fraught with tension, but also perhaps with potential. So it seemed a good time to ask four poets, each of whom works in languages that incorporate the verbal and the visual in various combinations, and each of whose work is implicitly or explicitly engaged with the between as a zone in which cultural practices can create spaces that open outward towards social and political ends. I'll mention each writer's specific relationship to these issues in the very brief introduction that I'll be giving before each of their readings. And the first reader is Atel Adnan. Atel is a writer and visual artist. Her many books include works in poetry, fiction, essay, and theater. And her visual work includes pieces in watercolor, acrylic, pencil, printmaking, and leporello. Leporellos are accordion books that she both writes and paints. Born in Lebanon, she speaks French, English, and Arabic, and currently lives in Paris. Thank you, Atel. Hello. Hello, good. Uh, I like to see that I, um, my friendship with God goes back probably some 30 years. So we didn't grow up together, but almost. And I am very happy that you all here and Susan too. Uh, I will read a passage from my latest book called Shifting the Science. Uh, it came out at night boat in uh, Brooklyn. I miss the cosmic energy of ancient Greece. They loved their God to whom everything was given, save the supreme power. Free, none of them were, in the absolute sense. Only this was, though his arbitrariness was often looked at with a critical eye. Prometheus was chained because he rebelled and he was condemned to suffer an opposite but equally radical punishment, to turn and turn and never rest. There was a new cruelty to their world, but I miss them just the same. To put one's feet on the rocks of dead fire is worth damnation. And to Pitionu, the offering for the oracle are still coming. For me, the pain of dying is going to be the impossibility of visiting that site one more time. When you have no way to go anywhere, what do you do? Of course, nothing. 
but that's no answer. We let so many replies go unformulated as a liberation of thought. So many tides uselessly advancing. So many desires are buried. The mind gets tired too. In the middle of the night, I measure the cold outside, the silence. To speak Greek is to use most of Aristotle's own words, but I rely on Aeschylus. He reminds me of the mystics from Bukhara. He placed promises on Mount Etna, linking him to Empedocles. How can one live away from their circle? But returning to my condition, if I had to choose a place to spend the night, what would it be? At this point, I will turn my back and go into my room. The major part of the beauty of the world I will ignore, if not all. There are so many islands I dreamed of visiting. Where have they gone? They're probably lying where they have always been. Do they possess a consciousness all of their own? I would think so. They are probably like the peacock who recognized me after all the years I had been absent when he made a loud sound of a kind I had never heard and made me joyful. He stirred a kinship between us. That was the end of a game for a world championship, a European football game, England against Colombia, the British team playing war, the South American playing for the fun of it. Always the same story. The peacock followed the excitement. It was late at night and he couldn't sleep. My thoughts drip, not unlike the photos. They don't let me know what they're about. Other ones follow, strangers equally. The daylight is getting dim. We're not in winter, no. We're somewhere in early July. The sunset will happen soon. Then it will disappear too. Dreams lack any power of decision, but come in bunches. Flow this, flood the spirit, shake the bones. They favor lovemaking while we refuse what we yearn for. Watching sunset after sunset doesn't heat the house. Watching the hours go by doesn't help either. Then we are cornered. I leave my door open, pretending it's because of my difficulty of breathing, but nothing is true. Better 
to admit that with the passing of days, we know less about just everything. Let's let things roll their own way whenever they have some. I am not used to asking for help, but on what kind of a ground am I standing? An incantation puts me to rest at last in undue hours. With eyes swollen, we try to see the here and the over there. Never sure, always dissatisfied. Let's wait even when we don't know what for. A faint line on the horizon, always more welcome than the wind. We have lost the liturgies unless the wars, the bombing, the fires we went through, some of it didn't survive and they were many. The Greeks had their exuberant God, the sunrise over Mount Olympus. The, the Canaanite Mount We have our own private mountains, but are they already from waiting for us? I have no road for them, no wires. In their splendor, let them be. There's a dance of firefly, little lights turning around the boat of the bay, tiny creatures chanting, fish jumping, the feast of early summer and siding in the heat and lemonade. We try to subvert the God, but their powers corrupt their soul with a race of mercenary. A tide of mud is moving on the shore, messing in midsummer, are sizzling. They burn one's skin and one's heart. Revelation is abundant over there. I need to simplify my thinking to come to the roots of the olive trees I have planted on my island, sit close to them, Look at every leaf. Start early in the morning, then close my eyes and let the morning sun touch my face. Go to the Mediterranean at the street corner. Go into its water, its salt, its acid colors, its heat. Oh Lord, let's stop thinking. Let just be. And for many hours in a row, merge 
with the vegetal and metallic kind of consciousness, which is so overpowering. And they just told me the saga of this young man from Thessaloniki, so handsome, they said, who was hit by the bullet of a hunter with whom he was on an outing. An accident, they said, knowing that he was condemned to Uh, with a stretcher and take them to take him to Delphi. They arrived. The oracle was long gone. He knew it. He thought that the very place would save him. It did, but not the way he expected it. It made him experience a sacred geometry, usually reserved to the initiate, but having them there was in itself an initiation. He understood that. He watched the sun for the last time. We have to reconnect what word separates it. The hell is Aristotle, though they must misunderstood sound of all philosophers. I would rather give back the leaves to the trees, the waves to the sea. Mm. All right. Thank you very much, Atel. That was just wonderful, wonderful to hear. Thank you. The next reader is Biswamit Dwebedi. He was born in Bhubaneswar, India, and he's a poet and a novelist. He currently lives in Paris, where he teaches at the American University there. He speaks Hindi, Oriya, English, and increasingly French. He works also in painting, graphics, and hand bookmaking. And just yesterday had a creative nonfiction book taken by Penguin Vintage. So welcome, Ms. Wamit. Hi, um, thank you so much for being here. And um, it is such an honor to read with Susan, Etel, Cole, and Gazel, some of my literally heroes. So this is, Wonderful, so thank you for inviting me. And um, I'm going to start by reading a short section from um, not my work, but um, a book by Mei Mei Brusenbrugge that just, just came out called A Treatise on Stars. And um, um, I just think what she's doing and the way of living and thinking that she's proposing in these poems is radical. So I'm gonna start with that and then I'm going to go into my work. Um, Okay. Singing, one. All day I feel the approach of dolphins. Their thoughts are in my mind. When I swim, my cells attune to them because oceans full of vibrations that transmit to water in my body. It's a repository of primordial data from space. All creatures in water can access the Akasha. Tones entering my cells transform into feeling and awareness of two worlds at once. I send back my thought, picture, feeling, and together we form new vibrations of knowledge that had been dormant in me. They're here. I swim out of the cove toward them. So happy, I hum, and their answering chorus reverberates across water. We know each other. One dolphin is still, far below me. Her form takes shape as she rises silently in blue, in bright blue, motionless, sunlit. 
Thank you for showing yourself, fulfilling a deep longing within my deep memory. Two, I empty my mind and listen for her reply, which comes as waves of emotion. A cloud surrounds me. I expand into its stillness and receive tones conveying information very fast. They teach me to hum, to whistle and sing. Sound amplifies my body across open water. Even their joyous play has this sensation of creating space. And when they sleep, stars augment their frequencies. We converse by mind cell helixes of image and feeling. Cosmic legacy, cosmic extension, imprint holographically on my heart neurons as dolphin empathy. There are sounds which can stop time, alter surroundings, or shift your dimension. Swimming, I lose my sense of place, even physicality, and connect with collective love. They teach me to join my aura with the cosmos by spiraling with me in sound star tetrahedrons and to love those with whom we merge. Then being is healing through innocence when the animal becomes the teacher. And um, these next series of poems I am going to read are from this book. Um, called the Temples of Kalinga, um, which is a longer project and um, might be published by Sober Scove Press. And my work before had never been um, either personal or political. And um, um, at a weak moment um, in a private pool, the editor, Julia Klein, um, convinced me to write books about um, the temples I grew up around um, in Orissa, particularly in the city of Bhubaneswar. So I'm just going to read a short series um, about a particular group of temples called the Cho City Yogini. Bhubaneswar, a world unknown by its names. Goldsmiths, filigranes, and pilgrims are Muslims who live around the city of temples. With Rameswara to the west, Bhaskareswar to the east, Kapileswar to the south, and again Rameswar on the north. Studded with ruins more thickly than Rome, and then studded again with hills, Lord Canning. The earliest records of which is in the reign of Yajati from 474 to 526 AD. And before it, the Buddhists, who are surprisingly accused of a massacre, and on whose ashes these kings were giving out rent-free lands. His vassalage on a copper plate records the evidence of three contemporary questions. A. Was the city removed from the mouth of the river to further a town? B. Does it just take a single person to raise a city? C. What does it mean when you divide the distance by direction and a little mistranslation to return to the self a child in every corner of every city you've ever been? Some say Bhubaneswar was a counterpart to Banaras, that most famous city on the Ganges. An action reflected on water. The fire that we set to the river blows out the darkness someplace else. If you have been to one city, you must go to the other or forever remaining, circambulating the boundary road. Yajamana, what comes first, the patron or the plan? Or borrowed from another book, Sir Mine, to your generosity, according to which the human essence is arranged. Sir, what does your being there do to our bodies that we can't? Put together forest, glade, seashore, hill, or town, meeting and marriage of heaven and earth. And not just that. On your behalf, I build a testament to our impermanence. Each time you kneel down to pray, you dig up a little bit of earth to set a small square in the middle of this new flat and invite the gods in. Like guests from your village, some stay for months, others for weeks, some visit us for 10 days, and others last just a few hours. Sati, let's play a game of joy and release. The sight is the control of the mind over hand and feet and controls all three as soon as you enter. 
It's all your technology combined on television, a legitimate show opines that Indian gods are aliens. These are patterns repeated over and over again. What he calls the qualities without a name. It's a video game where the warriors, a beautiful woman wearing grotesque masks and animals come to mate at night. Where cities that have made their way from mythology are now going back. That's what history is. No matter how beautiful the narrative, we must bid it goodbye. But how can I? It's right there when I wake up. Lesson one, if at any point the architect feels that he's failing, he should quit, never mind if these places weren't made, meant for pilgrimage. We are interested in daily lives, why you went there every day, and which one of your visits isn't seeking a darshan, a pilgrimage of the mind which everyone must seek at a certain age, which is to say the gods play around this lake. Any lake is itself the sun dispersed, and so things grow in darkness across 51 blooming cities on which fell the disembodied parts of a woman who thrived. I care about the rest of the world. Play. Inherent to our poetics is the idea of play through which the Supreme Spirit displays its presence in the world. This also shows in the way we talk, especially in the witty repartee between women dull, um, done almost entirely in verse. Now a lost way, considering how I don't speak to my aunts these days. The temple is breath itself and measured as such. If you move around it, it is also the wheel that moves because it symbolizes time. The temple should also have a lake or pond to the left where the power of the sacred body is most felt. The temple is an installation, a stage where performance is built into the design. You move and the lovers, dancers, move along with you, changing positions, and by the time the world has spun divinity freed from its image, a temple is always erected, a ritual diagram that regulates the growth of civilizations. The elation and elevation are related, in a sensuous relationship, and hence the arrival of stairs for the body which seeks to reach its highest point. And release a vision for which we had climbed, had waited, stood in line all day. Step by step we rise until at the very top, a fierce lion guarding the untamed sun, the unnamed God, whose gender it takes us some time to figure out. Centuries, in fact. These are all ancient names of what you will once call your own. The shape of the altar is independent of time. Each temple is an offering made to the gods by giving them a home. An inward realization can only be achieved by draining out your wealth and strength. And so he goes on another building rampage, a world conquer campaign, as my brother used to say, and drew a straight line across a map to let the priest and the architect connect the fact that it was often a queen on whose insistence these stone gardens were built. We worship the generosity of Queen Hira Devi of Brahma dynasty. In the ninth century, during which many queens ruled Kalinga. It was a time when Tantric Buddhism was influencing Brahminical Hinduism, whose gift is the most unique temples of Haripur, Josati Yogini, 64 goddesses, all waiting for their turn. At the time of writing this, I hadn't been there yet. Now I find out there is more than one of them scattered around the country where we worship the absence of a roof over, over our heads. So we can be connected not to the idols, but the stars, the space created between Bhumandala, atmosphere carved into the inner walls. Kali. To trace the history of her most, most, most famous pose, we recollect her battle with the demon called Raktabija, who bled and with each drop, drop formed a duplicate. She licked each one with her tongue as other forms of her kept wounding him. 
And so it is the multiplicity inside that overcomes the numerous that the many of me fight, rampant, unco uncontrollable, in fact. Was shocked to discover that in her rage, she had stepped on her husband and hence her tongue sticking out in every shop in this neighborhood. The my love for architecture of this neighborhood can be traced back to Enid Blyton, a friend proposed. When I thought it was because of an uncle who was a contractor and took me along with him to construction sites on hot afternoons. I made castles out of tile samples, plywood, a house in which everything moved. Eight times eight equals 64. But I was wrong. There are 56 idols inside and eight along the outer walls who stand, a cup in each hand, balanced on an animal who waits for the blood from a sacrifice to trickle down their stone mouths open. It is impossible to quench their thirst. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was so visual, really delightful. The next reader is Susan Howe, a native of New England where she still lives. Susan Howe began her career as a visual artist and early on segued into writing while also pioneering an unusual type of visual verbal fusion that splices printed words into intricate patterns that foreground their graphic nature while problematizing legibility. She's also worked extensively with the visuality of Emily Dickinson's manuscripts. Please welcome Susan. Hi. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here. And um, uh, when Cole said we were to read political poetry, um, I thought all poetry is politics. But um, I, I was all ready to look up angry Irish Yatesian poems. <laughs> With, connected with our current situation. And I mean, I'm thrilled by the election, but as you all know, um, anyway, there are problems. But a, a, after thinking about it, I thought, and it seems like most of you have, are doing a similar turn, which is to hell with that, I'm turning to nature. And, and I thought um, I would read uh, Laureen Niedeker's um, Wintergreen Ridge so that we can all hear the beauty of that poem at this time again. And to think that it was written in 1967, the year of the March on the Pentagon and um, people, Americans going into space, but really basically the beginning of the bombing part of um, the Vietnamese war. So she wrote this on a trip, she lived all her life in Wisconsin and she wrote this on a trip to uh, the Door uh, County Peninsula which is in the north of Wisconsin. She lived in the south, which, jut, which juts out onto Lake Michigan. And there they visited um, this uh, sanctuary, Ridges Sanctuary, which was a nonprofit um, nature preserve um, that still exists if Trump hasn't done away with it. I, anyway, um, it, that houses wonderful 500 species of plants and is famous for the orchids um, on these trails. Anyway, I'm gonna read that wintergreen ridge and then I'm just gonna read three short pieces from um, my recent book, Concordance. Wintergreen Ridge, where the arrows of this road signs lead us. Life is natural in the evolution of matter. Nothing super rock about it. Simply, butterflies are quicker than rock. Man lives hard on this stone perch by sea, imagines durable works in creation here, as in the center 
of the world, let's say, of art. We climb the limestone cliffs, my skirt dragging an inch below the knee, the style before the last, the last, the least, to see Norway, or half of Sussex and almost all of Surrey, Crete perhaps, and further. Every creature better alive than dead, men and moose and pine trees. We are gawks lusting after wild orchids. Wait, what's this? Sign. Flowers loveliest where they grow. Love them, enjoy them, and leave them so. Let's go. Evolution's wild ones saved continuous life through change from time began Northland's unpainted barns, fish and boats, now this flowering ridge, the second one back from the lighthouse. Who saved it? Women of good wild stock stood stolid before machines. They stopped bulldozers cold. <laughs> Women saved a pretty thing, truth a good to the heart. It all comes down to the family. We have a lovely finite parentage, mineral, vegetable, animal. Nearby dark wood. I suddenly heard the cry, my mother's, where the light pissed past the pistolet cone. How she loved close gentians. She herself so closed. And in this to us, peace, the stabbing pen. Friend did it close to the heart, pierced the woods red. Autumn, sometimes it's a pleasure to grieve or dump the leaves most brilliant as do trees when they've no need of an overload of cellulose for a cool while. Nobody, nothing ever gave me greater thing than time, unless light and silence, which if intense makes sound unaffected by man. Thin to nothing, lichens grind with their acid granite to sand. These may survive the grand blow up, the bomb. When visited by the poet from Newcastle on Tyne, I neglected to ask, what wild plants have you there? How dark, how inconsiderate of me. Well, I see at this point, no pelting of police with flowers, no uprooted gay wings, bishop's cup, white bunchbury under aspens. Pipisua, wintergreen, grass of Parnassus, See beyond ferns, algae, water lilies. Scent the simple, the perfect order of that flower, water lily. I see no space rocket launched here, no mind changing acids eaten, one sort manufactured as easily as gin in a bathtub. Do feel, however, in liver and head as we drive toward cities, the change in church architecture. Now it's either a hood for a roof pulled down to the ground and below, or a fact factory long body crawled out from a rise of black dinosaur necked, blower beaked, smokestack steeple. Murder in the cathedral's proportions. Do we go to church? No use discussing heaven. H.J.'s father long ago pronounced human affairs gone to hell. Great God, what men desire. The scientist, a full set of fishes, the desire to know another, to talk, beat, act cool, release, la, go. So far out of flowers, human parts found 
wrapped in newspaper, left at the church near College Avenue, more news of the war, which cannot be stopped. Ragweed pollen, sneezeweed, whose other name, Ambrosia, goes for community. Ahead, hometown, second shift, steam fitter, ran arms out as though to fly, dived to concrete from loading deck, lost his head. Pigeons, I miss the gulls, mourn the loss of people. No wild bird does. It rained, mud squash, willow leaves in the eaves. Old sunflower, you bowed to no one but great storm of equinox. And then I just finished with these three uh, short, poem, very short, uh, cut up poems from Concordance, my book. Fragments, feed and shelter it. And when I was still another behest, which it, nevertheless, I endured it. Why, T, which gave us our body, takes it, bear it. I love it, says somebody, was just now saying, is it not natural, you, this very affection? But the says, let it go now and have with it. They leaved Bedford Creek, creeping, cricket bat, dark leaves, dwarf, French, golden, Lapland, net leaved, saddlers, tea leaved, tree, small, weeping, white, portal leaf, woolly, Willows, withy, alphabet of stars alone does, lost notebook, echo, echo, I love you, breathe, breathe. Hermit thrush, sparrow, 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 sparrow. Sparrow, 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 sparrow. Starling, swallow, swallow, swallow. Thanks. That's it. Wonderful. That's great. And I want to underscore too that the visuals are wonderful to look at in that in that book so um find, find that and enjoy it uh next uh we have hazal mosadek born in iran hazal is a writer who works in poetry and various verbal visual hybrids that incorporate collages sketches and typographical invention into her texts she speaks persian and english and has studied turkish french and arabic She's recently started a press, Paminar, dedicated to international experimental poetry, and she lives in London. So uh, thank you, Hazar. Thank you, Cole. Thank you for asking me to read, and thanks, The Rail. What an honor. I will read first uh, on the theme of radical poetry uh, from a poet that I'm uh, inspired by her friendship, her work, and, uh, and her writing, Francis Crook. Francis Crook um, used to live here in London, so among the experimental uh, writing circles uh, in London, she's uh, very much known, but uh, for those who are not among those circles, she's a Canadian Polish writer who um, lives right now in Canada, translates from French, um, and I am going to read from her book, uh, Low Five Frags in Progress. It was published 2015 by Veer Books here in London. 
and it has lots of amazing visuals. Um, I wish I could have a slide to show, but I can show you some of the collages that she makes. Um, I don't know how clear they are, but um, yeah, just, just random. Reading from the first section of uh, the book, Lo-Fi Frags, the book starts with this poem. Where am I that I speak so naturally? I tried to move, but fell right through the eggshells, dropped the floor, lost time, lost weight, the concrete, the meat, the dust, and sick, and rat piss, and somewhere in there, the mass scum of result not worth discussing, but problems. Wars, debt, batteries, stuff, and heads. So all right, all right, sit still in the ferocity, limbs extended with provisional sticks, constructed of pencils, taped to pencils, taped to pencils, scribble, hiss, split, and howl of clouds spun out. Are you still there? Which floor? Now I'm reading for another section in this book, uh, Down You Go or Negacion de Puy. This is the, um, these are a series of poems that Francis wrote while uh, translating uh, Daniel Colbert. One, swarms. We will bang into the sun blinded, thirsty, howling, Two, I revolt, project, spasm in the pit socked blind by white lights. Three, subterranean gallery and the fist against deaf walls, glittering, the mind shaft dump, the hands. Four, bound underground on hooks, you put the holes in the dream head, drill geometry, six claw solitaire forever. Five, I was or am in the chasm, refracted through the dream head shut, crackle hard, mauve in the passage, tiny dogs on ice all round, tiny, tiny dogs in house. Six, looking through the mirror, there is that inner circle, the hands, heads, faces frozen, and even with the air moves crystal flakes, they look ready, ready. Seven, the most pathetic poem is small people on fire. So, Thanks, Francis. And uh, now I'm going to uh, read an excerpt from a long poem that, it, that jumps back and forth in specific um, histories in Iran, which I'm not going to explain, but if those sounds and languages and uh, the historical intertextual illusions are unfamiliar, um, that's uh, perhaps in itself can be an explainer on what uh, the poem tries to invoke. F. If the Bab Homayun and the Gulistan Palace existed, but you knew Reza Shah was nothing less than a land grabbing pig and nothing more than an illiterate Cossack Iranian on the payroll of the occupiers. If you knew he was in awe of the crown on that fat child king's head who walked down those stairs, if the road was expanded, and if you knew you could get closer. 
a eucalyptus lined street, the waterway, a rill made of stone in the south garden, if it looked in different order in a canary's eye, if you were that canary. If things had been built to order differently, and yes, if there were azaleas, the skin, and the apparatus of modern life, I mean, if and only if we all agreed that there was a negative force there from the beginning. But back then, when I kept walking on the buffer zone, the oil was in neutral zones in Khuzestan by the Karun River, and the constitutionalism was still breathing in Tabriz, in Isfahan, in Rasht. For many years. And if we kept that story alive for many years, but forgot about our famines, if we agreed that a pact of words can contain our mistrust, yet we chose silence as a method of self-care, and if Nasiruddin Shah had not lived for one million years, and if the Golestan Palace maintained its light forever, and if you passed the Bab Homayun and the door stood ajar and you saw the Thames running in its rills. If I had become modern enough to fill the chasm of Nasiruddin's inferiority complex, but if I repeated and kept repeating, but it still didn't connect me to anything new, and if I believed in myself, if I was true to myself, if I repeatedly said I love you to myself, peeping into a mirror, if I called my claws royal fingers, if I controlled the fragments of my psyche as they threatened to fracture again, if I purchased that hand cream, which I could buy if I paid more, then could I say if I applied that cream, if I counted the number of streets leading to the palace, if I passed the rills and the garden, if I entered the building, if I went inside to see a class of statesmen smoking galyan, and if they saw me, if only they saw me, they saw my crisscross pigeon toed and wobbly, but if they took me, as a symbol of a nomadic uprising. And if just this time they cared to listen to the voice of Amir Khiz coming out of my chest as a bird song, and if I was found out, I mean, if they realized I was not a nomadic uprising, but that I was passing between spheres of influence, of lost territory, no more than a small piece in a great game. Remember that game, that tournament of shadows? Just passing the 19th century and the 20th as a canary passing the Bob Homayun before thinking of entering the palace. And I cared nothing at that very moment for the monotony of statesmen. Instead, I was free enough to be transformed into anything. If I didn't want to be transformed into the Tehran police force since 1906 or six dynasties back, Tehran wasn't there, but the police were not with that name, no. Gazme they were, no, or the Daruqe. But they, if they were the Daruqe, and if I passed from the Bab Homayun, if it occurred to me that some sort of resistance was tolerated, just a little. And if that little could be communicated to the municipalities before everything crumbled, I mean, if there was a name for the nightmare daydream I'm capable of. But if the famine returned twice in 40 years, and if the, despite the cover up, we knew that half the population had been wiped out. But if the occupiers didn't buy the crops and the landowners didn't hoard them, and if the allies didn't prevent the import, and if I myself hadn't found huge bags of wheat under the fat child king's bed, and if we knew where to line up the corpses. 
If the springtime arrived again, if there was a residential unit on the left-hand side of the palace, and if it was demolished, and if, and only if that belonged to the last poet laureate of Tehran, and if his name was Bahor, and if he was known to have a canary, and if, and only if a man with the same garment as Bahor was assassinated instead of him outside of the newspaper office, and if Bahor had written an elegy for that dead man, and the canary had read the poem, and if the cage had been left open, and if it was summer night, dry and dark, and the cricket singing, and if I found myself right at Baba Homayun at sundown, if the doors to the jar, if I found the Thames running in the rills, and if there was a constellation of the elite, the statesmen sitting there smoking galion, and if I was allergic to small smoke, if I were a canary, and if I was to avoid all the cliché, and yet I was a canary at a Qajar society. And if before me was my father, and before him was his grandmother, and if she was a nomadic woman, but if it was the cash for hijab era, but the grandmother was too old to leave the house anyway. I mean, if unconsciously I gave an affirmation that changed my lifestyle on the site of an architectural structure, and if the Qajars were still looking at the canary, and if uttering a song was mimicking your own sound, if you could repeat yourself, instead you thought why I'm not included in this, in the life of mine, and if Bahar was the name of a street only in springtime, if the infamous cluster of cronies in the Golestan complex and the east were the last to see a bird flying in from the Orosi, diving through the smoke, and they thought there's Bahor and there's a canary, but the constitutional revolution wasn't going to live long enough to accommodate all of us, our chandeliers and prayer rugs, and still be there on every drowsy afternoon. And if the wall constructed a labyrinth within itself. And if you knew where there were no white walls, where there is no silence, and if it wasn't just a multiple dream, and if this was not one of those dreams where you go to the office in your pajamas or cry for your dead living mother, dead again, alive again, but if a pointless excursion took you through an Orosi, and if the Orosi stood ajar, and who you are not to fly in, but if there was smoke in the labyrinth, and if the adjacent house was not, and you didn't care if the whole world was on fire, and if a charcoal on a galleon was diffusing carbon monoxide, and you felt nauseous. Thank you. That's Thank you. Fascinating work. Really lovely to hear. Uh, I'm going to end with seven or eight minutes of um, a combination of things. So uh, I thought I would read not from a poet, but from a radical gardener. Gilles Clément is a French landscape architect, park designer, and horticultural theorist and he's made foundational changes to the way that land use issues are understood in France with potential repercussions for agricultural practices as a whole. Three principal concepts direct his work, the planetary garden, the garden in movement, and the third landscape. All three are aspects of his underlying conviction that the planet is a garden of species in constant migration and adaptation a nomadic plurality whose diversity it is crucial to cultivate. I'm going to read some passages that present his ideas. These are from his writings excerpted and presented in a book titled The Planetary Garden, 
the landscape architecture of Gilles Clément. It's translated from French, but maddeningly, I can find no mention of the translator. The credit is given to a corporation. So with apologies to the unknown translator, quote, the garden in movement interprets and develops the energies found in the place and attempts to work as much as possible with and as little as possible against nature. Its name refers to the physical movement of plant species on the land, which the gardener interprets in their own way. Flowers grown in the middle of a path oblige the gardener to choose, should they conserve the passage or the flowers. The garden in movement recommends respect for the species that settle there in an autonomous way. Plants travel, especially herbs. They move in silence like the wind. Nothing can be done about the wind. Were we to harvest the clouds, we would be surprised to find unpredictable seeds mixed in with the fertile silt. Unthinkable landscapes are already being designed in the sky. Untilled land. I love untilled land because there nothing has to do with death. A walk in an untended place is open to all questions because everything that happens there is bound to elude even the most adventurous speculations. The fact that the International Federation of Landscape Architects classifies abandoned industrial areas as endangered landscapes is a truly revealing sign. The reappropriation of land by nature is interpreted as decay when it is actually the exact opposite. The third landscape. It is abandoned spaces that are the main territories of refuge for biological diversities. These include leftover territory, both rural and urban, and the untilled zones, the edges of roads and fields, of industrial areas and nature reserves. These are spaces of indecision and the living things that occupy them act freely. The third landscape is a biological necessity that influences the future of all living things and recognizing this alters our interpretation of these spaces and attributes value to places that are normally neglected. So I encourage uh, you to Google him. He's got a great website uh, and uh, if you're interested in those ideas. I'm going to shift to an excerpt of a hybrid essay poem that I wrote on an important 19th century American park designer named Frederick Law Olmsted, because some of his views, though they were manifested really differently, have much in common with those of Gilles Clément. So this is an excerpt from Olmsted, The Centrality of the Park. A park as an integral element of the city urban in nature, there is nothing that's not natural and they certainly don't exist in the wild. A park, land textured in art, a landscape making what's close look both way in the distant and within arm's reach. By this, we are increased. Frederick Law Olmsted, a farmer who chose his farm for the view, who became one of his country's first landscape architects almost by accident. He'd worked as an investigative reporter, publisher, mine supervisor, army hospital administrator, political activist, and abolitionist, among many other things, when the post came open for the superintendent of Central Park. Writing out the application by hand, quote, we see a million people of all backgrounds and stations skating with the sun setting behind them through half a million trees. His initial plan was 10 feet long and required tiny sketches in pencil of all the half million. So everyone who came by his house, from creditors to relatives to everybody's children, was handed a pencil, handed a tree, a tree always itself a hand, and thus within any hand, another half million. Olmsted and his partner, Calvert Vaux, won the commission. Olmsted's dream was, above all, to create the stage for an egalitarian democracy, and it was oddly successful. The lake turned out to be one of its most popular features. It was the element that opened the park on December 11, 1858, with ice skating, 
which instantly became all the rage. There on the slipperiest of surfaces, all classes literally slid in and out of each other. Some came with their footmen, others were footmen on their day off, while others came from factory work or any number of other occupations. And it was one of the few situations at the time in which men and women could meet unchaperoned. Two million people visited Central Park during its first year, at times up to 100,000 a day. By the 1870s, it was up to 10 million a year, all of them struck by the fact that a park does not import into the city anything alien to it, but instead proves that open meadows, sculpted forests, expansive flowers, flowering plums, and sailboats for rent are all innate aspects of urbanity and encourage alterity, errancy, all the benefits of getting lost. Quote, such spaces we will make public and encourage the people to come here to let their minds wander, unquote. Wander is the heart on saunter, echoing Thoreau's etymology. Saunter, saunter as saunter, as without land to call my own. So I call it everyone's, now come home. Again, to amble, as a park always does, amble out of itself and must, in fact, exceed its forms, its terms, its time. It's the nature of growth. Landscape architecture is the only form of art that necessarily destroys itself. The exuberant grief of trees exploding so slowly. Olmsted, in his earliest notes, in laying out Central Park, we determined to think of no result to be realized in under 40 years. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much, Cole. And thank you, Atel, Vizwamit, Susan, and Hazal. It was so, so incredible to hear each of you. Um, thank you also to everyone who tuned in today. We have a couple of events tomorrow at 1 p.m. Common Ground, a conversation with Elena Del Rivero, Alana Odoms, Cara Tuchina Olage, and Andrea Anderson on the storied history of the 19th Amendment and universal suffrage in this country. Um, tomorrow at 7 p.m., please join us for Theater of War's Poetry for the Pandemic, featuring Dr. Joshua Bennett, Mahogany L. Brown, Juan Philippe Herrera, Molly McCauley Brown, Patricia Smith, and special guest Lucy Toms and Bill Murray. And next Wednesday, of course, another radical poetry reading. Next week is curated by Ajua Garji and Zinga Greaves. And you all now should have the ability to activate your microphones and say goodbye as you leave. Thank you all so much. Bye. Bye. Thank, you. Bye. Thank, Bye. You. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. That Very was much. so wonderful. Everyone. Wonderful. Thanks, great poems. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thank wow. you. Good job, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank